I'm absolutely delighted to welcome today the very funny, the very gorgeous Lynn Ruth Miller, all the way from America, but currently in London, I believe, Lynn Ruth. That's right. That's right. Well, I started in Brighton for two and a half years above a fish and chip shop, and now I'm in London. So that's when you came to England from America, was it, two and a half years ago? No, no, no. I came to, uh, I was to 2014. Okay. And what, what made you move from America? I got a job. I, I had uh, created a show called Granny's Gone Wild, and it won Best Cabaret of the Edinburgh Festival. And the man that produced it, and he produced it minimally, he did not even uh, supply all the money, but he lived in Brighton. And when it won Best Cabaret of the Edinburgh Festival, he decided that I was ready for the O2. Wow. So he started, which is not true. And he had started a TV station in Brighton called The Latest. He came out uh, and he started that and he wanted me to be a presenter. So I came, the prize for my winning the best cabaret of the Edinburgh Festival was two weeks in Soho. And I got, I've managed to do that in April, 2014. And that was when Bill offered me a job as a presenter and he hired me that September. And I went home, I had a house that had been foreclosed. It had been foreclosed. So I thought, why not? I can't keep this house forever. I was trying, but I can't keep this house forever. And I've got a job and, 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 and security and a visa. And so I went home, closed the house in two weeks with a broken wrist. And I came back in September and I did the program until December when he fired me. And that was when I realized, and I, I didn't have enough money to come home. And I thought to myself, okay, you made this move with the best, you thought it would be all right. He never did get the visa, but you're just gonna have to make it work. So I did. I found somebody to give me a rotating visa three every three months. It wasn't what I wanted, but it made me legal. I managed to filter into the comedy scene in Brighton and in London, and now in the whole UK, and also the world. And I just, I created this life bit by bit. And the, because, because I could not go back and I did not want to go back. So often we get to a stage, Elaine, where we say, this isn't working. I'm going back to where it's safe. No, in that time, you've grown, you've changed. You're a different person than you were back there then. By the time I was fired, I was a different person with a different sensibility than when I was living in a foreclosed house in, in Pacifica, California. And I need to make that person's life, which I did. And I did, and it did not happen. I don't want anyone to think that any miracle happened at all. There was never, oh look, <laughs> it was inch by inch by inch. But people in Britain, you can say what you like. I don't know about the government. I don't have that much confidence, but people in Britain always want to help. You, you'll find some, and usually if they don't, they will not have been living here very long. Native British people always want to help. And that's how I did it. I could never have gotten where I am now without help from a variety of people that all everyone would give me a helping hand. For example, when I was fired, I no longer had money. The man that owned, I was living above Bardsley's Fish and Chips. He said to me, you can live here as long as you want. You don't have to pay rent. You can live here as long as you want. 
I was able to pay the rent because of my pension. But the fact that he said that to me immediately, he said, don't worry, you've got a place to stay. And if you need food, you can eat a lot of fish and chips, you know. Wonderful. So what was the job then, Lynn Ruth? What was the job that Bill offered you? Oh, it was to be a presenter on his TV program. And this was easy for me to do because I had two TV programs in Pacifica where I was the presenter. One was a book review and an arts review program, and the other was a hands-on painting. But I was the presenter. So this was just doing what I had been doing for 14 years. Except the difference was that with my own programs, I found the people to interview. With this one, he had someone else finding the people to interview. I loved it. I thought I did a pretty good job. He said I didn't, but I believe it was not that. He found out that if he went to the university in Brighton, he could get somebody who was majoring in TV to do what I was doing for nothing. And I, because that's who started being the presenters, really young girls, mm. beautiful young girls, because they ran my programs, which were supposed to be so terrible, for the next two years. Okay. They over and over. So, so tell us what you did before you were doing the TV presenting in America. So what, what, what's your background? I have a master's in education. So I've taught children and I've taught university and I have a master's in journalism. And what I did mostly was be um, a freelance journalist. And I have never, and I think it's interesting because some people can earn a living at freelance journalism. I've never ever made enough to help me through. Because one of the things that's very interesting, there's a book by a man named David Weeks, and he it's called The Eccentrics. And he says, people who are eccentric like being eccentric. I'm eccentric. But I wrote him and I said, no, you don't realize you're eccentric. And so my writing was just a little out of the box. My, the people I interviewed were just a little out of the box. And I could not get that niche where they would actually hire me and commit me, commit to a salary for me. And the, the trying and the failing made me sick. And I think it's very important, especially in the light of what we were talking about before. Evidently, when I get slammed against walls that I really cannot penetrate, I get sick. And what happened with that one was that my digestion stopped working. Ah, we're back to that again. My digestion stopped working. I stopped absorbing food. I just didn't absorb it. And this went on for a very long time. But because of that, I had a disability pension because I couldn't teach anymore. I wanted to teach, but I couldn't because, uh, but you have to understand that I never thought of myself as sick. If I would tell you what I looked like, you would be appalled. I was, the food, I was not digesting food. And I was not only not, I was at the National Institutes of Health, which is the best hospital in the United States. And there was a lab technician who was my friend and she said, you're not only not digesting the food you're putting in, but you're putting out more. In other words, part of my body was going out as well. I was killing myself. And I left the hospital. And this is something I always worry about because I don't want people to think that I have some te terminal illness. Well, I'll do that too. It's something about an internal thing I knew. I, they told me I was dying. And I can see from the lab results why they thought I was. Mm. I mean, but you know, you know you're not. Mm. You just know you're not. So I left the hospital. It was a um, free hospital because it was an experimental hospital because I was like nothing they'd ever seen before. And I left the hospital and I um, uh, came home and I got a dog and I walked the dog every day and ate non-processed food, mm -hmm. no processing whatsoever. 
but I ate everything. I ate things that people these days say are terrible for you. I ate meat. I ate that. Oh, no, I really, I ate meat and vegetables. Nothing in a bag, nothing in a can, nothing. A coffee, maybe. Yeah, that's it. And I did it for nine years, but I knew I could get better. And so do you eat like that now? Not quite as limited. When I moved to California in 1980, for no philosophical reason, because I never have enough money, fish was cheaper than meat. So I stopped eating red meat. And I haven't eaten it since. However, because of, I remember I also had anorexia. So because of the way I used food to control people and control myself, the way I am now, I will not allow, if you, if I came to your house for dinner and you gave me red meat, I would eat it. Mm -hmm. If I go to a restaurant, I won't order it. Mm -hmm. If I go shopping, I won't buy it. But I will not allow myself, since I believe all food is 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 good in moderation, mm -hmm. I will not allow myself to play around with food. The reason is that I read somewhere, I've had anorexia and food issues since I was 16. And I read, I think it must have been when I was 60, I read somewhere that when you go to someone's home or go out to eat and say, I can't eat this and I can't eat this and I can't eat this. It's an attention getting device. And yeah, and I said, I'm not gonna do that. Mm. Good for you. It sounds as though you've got some drilling or something going on where you are. Yes, yes, and I can't shut it. There's no- yeah, not, I, not to worry, yeah, not, not to worry. Um, so, um, you changed your career from being a journalist, from being a teacher, Tell us how old you were when you changed your career and what did you change it to? I wanted to, I discovered a, a thing called a comedy college. And because I led a very isolated life, I was not aware that stand up comedy was a career. So when I saw comedy college, you have to think if you just see comedy college, of all the ridiculous things. And remember, I was a journalist who never made it. Mm -hmm. So I thought, well, this is my big chance. I'm gonna expose these people and show that they're charging young people a lot of money for the most ridiculous thing. Who needs a degree in comedy for God's sake? And so I called the man and I said, I would like to take the class to write about it. And he said, <laughs> he said, I just love small Jewish women. <laughs> well, so I took the class and he, he considers me by the way, his poster girl because I have a knack for it. I have a knack for the smart remark. And that's what stand-up comedy is. And so I took the class, I wrote about it. Um, if you like, I'll send you the story I wrote. Uh, I, I, yeah, so send me Lena's story, Lena's story. And, um, uh, and, and I decided I'm going to do this. You have to realize I was 70. I was 70. I was on a, a pension. I had no idea that this was a young man's career. And so I couldn't understand why, when I knew I was funny, that they wouldn't even put me up at open mics. They didn't have to pay me. And this is in California. I had a car. So it was really no effort. You got in the car and you drove there and told your jokes and came back. They didn't want me. But then a lady whose name is Betsy Salkin, who is a very good comedian in LA now, said to me, Lynn Ruth, someone like you, me having no idea that I'm unique in what I'm doing, she said, someone like you needs to make your own shows. So my whole history through my life has been well, if that's what I need to do, I'll do it. So I went to a place called Winter's Bar, which was a redneck blue collar bar. I think I was probably the first Jew they ever saw. And the owner was brand new and his name was Don Holloway and I adore him. And he said to me, listen, Lenurth, if you wanna do comedy here, take that side of the bar. 
So I did. And I um, got the comedians. And remember, the open mic people in San Francisco were very full of themselves. I wasn't. So, of course, everybody loved me. You can do an open mic there and you get paid. We passed the bucket. You get paid. Sometimes you only got a dollar, but you always got paid. So we did it every Friday night for two or three years. Eventually, he paid me. And then he sold the bar. And it was not too conducive to my comedy. So I would go around to the other bars in, in Pacifica to see if they wanted me. And there's a there's a comedian named Michael Slack, who is wonderful, who said to me, whenever Lynn Ruth books me, I just go to Pacifica and I go to every bar until I find her. <laughs> and, that's happened. and then, because I had been a punter and a reviewer at the Edinburgh Festival, starting in 2005, 2003 is when I started, 2005, I started going to the Edinburgh Festival and bringing comedians with me. Oh. And that's how I learned, met people from England. And that's how I met Bill Smith. Because after I did the Edinburgh Festival for several years, I started doing the Brighton Festival. So I would come over on a disability income that was so low, I can't believe I did this, twice a year. And I found places to stay that I could afford. I found uh, venues I could, I could, and, and I, I never made money, Elaine, but I never lost money. Mm -hmm. And I'm not in this for the money. I'm in it for the life. Mm -hmm. The best thing I can tell you is to go back to what happened yesterday that I've already told you about. I did 15 minutes of comedy for a lot of people who were 70 and 80 years old. And I have not been feeling well. But when I was on that stage, I felt like a million pounds. Mm. And I just got the owner, the man that books it, whom I adore, because he's gone to so much trouble to do this, wrote me and he said to me, you were wonderful yesterday. He didn't know that I haven't been able to swallow food for a month and a half. <laughs> because I was. Because someone said to me, are you sorry that you found stand-up when you so late? And I said, no. And they said, well, did you hate all the work you did before? And I said, no. I loved my jobs. But the difference was, they were jobs. This is my life. Mm. Tell life. the listeners how old you are, Lynn Ruth. I'm 87. I'll be 88 in three months. Mm. Not yes. Very good. So there's, there, you know, nothing is ever too late. Nothing is ever wasted, is it? I say to people that I've never done a day's work in my life because I've always enjoyed what I do. And if I don't enjoy it, the minute I stop, I reinvent myself, you know, some somewhere else. And you think it's about, you know, you, you were you were ill, disabled from, from, from work, but you weren't poorly kind of thing. You were, because oh. it's an attitude of mind, isn't it? It is. And it's also a determination. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. So what, what kind of gigs are you doing at the moment then? Oh, at the, and this is something else. Let me, let me give you this saying. Anne Morrow Lindbergh who was the wife of Charles Lindbergh, the first transatlantic flight, was, uh, he did that, was a very conservative Catholic girl. And she wrote diaries. And uh, those of you who know her story know that their first child was kidnapped. And it was a tragedy, a, a global tragedy. Anyway, so she writes her diaries. And I read all her diaries. And one of them is called open windows, closed doors. And she says in that diary, you push and push and push at a door. And then one day you say, oh, it's open. And it has been for a long time. I have been pushing at the comedy and the cabaret door forever. And in London for the past seven and a half years, pushing, pushing. When lockdown eased, all of a sudden, 
I've gotten, usually I have to ask for the venues. I have to call. I haven't had to ask for any of these venues. I've got, I've got gigs all the time. The Posh Club and then um, this Saturday is Angel Comedy. Uh, last Sunday was uh, Top Secret. Um, in August, I'm doing something with Dog at an F Grave. Really pays a lot of money. I have a Radio 4 special July 2nd. Um, I, uh, the Crazy Cox, which if you don't know it, it's the best cabaret venue in London. Asked me if I wanted to do a gig and I said yes, and it's gonna be August 11th. They're doing a benefit for me June 27th because I'd like to get a PhD. I didn't ask for any of this. It all has happened. Wow, true inspiration. So what would you say to younger people who, you know, these, these snowflakes we've got in the world now that seem to be the slightest little thing, they break a fingernail and they have to have a lay down, you know, you've got people like you that are, you know, there, that you're robust. How, how, how do you, how do you inspire people? I'm going to tell you, if you explain the snowflakes again, because I'm not understanding, is that they don't do anything? Snowflakes, in my view, are people who are, they seem to be um, a, a generation that is just fragile. They're, they're very soft, they're fragile, they're vulnerable, you know, they're highly anxious, uh, mental health, they have mental health days. And, and of course, everybody has mental health issues from time to time, but not to the extent we've got now. I mean, it's just been ridiculous. It seems the slightest little thing that they do, and obviously I'm generalizing and there's lots of wonderful people out there, but um, when you, you know, we, we all have to get on in life and we all have to make our own way. We can't go around blaming it. You know, it's your fault. It's the person's fault. That happened to me, blah, blah, blah. In that state, self we seem to have so many victims in, in the world at the moment and not enough people. We don't have enough robust, you know, come on people, put, put, put your big girl boy pants on, you know, put yourself up. Um, we, we seem to lost all of that. Yes, I, I, the, the first thing I'm going to say to you and to the snowflakes is worry never solves a thing. Worry never solves a thing. The other thing is the only person that you must take care of, the only person you must take care of is yourself. But you must, you can't expect others to do it for you. You must take responsibility for yourself. This is something I have always done. No matter, things don't always turn out the way I expect. But I have to take responsibility for who I am and have faith that my dreams, my goals are valid, are valid. I think that's the big thing. You think, oh, why do I want to do this? I'm not good enough. Or why do I want to do this? Look at all those people that are way ahead of me. I'll never be that famous. I, or I don't have the money to pay for all that. You can't think that way. You have to think. This is my, I'll give you another quote. This is where I want to be. And William David Thoreau says, he's a wonderful writer. He wrote Walden. And he says, build your castles in the air and then start building the foundation. And I say to you, build your castles in the air, start building the foundation. All of a sudden you're going to say, oh, the foundation went here. So you have to move that castle. Don't be hung up on something that isn't working. The art of a, a successful life is to know when it's time to redirect and time to quit. And the other thing that is really important is to have faith that everything you've done in life is a step toward where you're going. It's not a failure. There's no such thing as failure. We do our best. It isn't as if you woke up one day and you say to yourself, well, today I'm just gonna make a total mess of it. You don't. You wake up and you say, I'm gonna do this and I'm gonna do that. And then what happens is you do this and then that doesn't work and you think, stupid me, or I hate that person. Yeah. The other thing is going back to taking responsibility. It is so easy to blame the market, to blame uh, the people in charge, to blame the millionaires, to blame the government. The art of living 
is to read the situation you're in. Yeah, absolutely true. And that's and that's what we're missing at the moment. We don't have the older generation to um, give that advice and guidance to the younger generation. And of course, what's happening in the world now, they you know, they um, we, we, we have all this division. So we don't have continuity. Um, I'm I'm starting to write a, another book and it's called In the Middle and it's um, it's covering six generations. I've discovered some letters from my great grandmother to her future son-in-law when he was just discharged from the Second World War. So oh. I've got, and I've also got my granddad on the other side of the family. I've got his first World War diary when he was in the trenches with Earl somebody or other. He was Batman to uh, the Earl of Meath, I think it is. So um, I've got various different, um, a whole spread. So from my great grandmother to my grandchildren. So I'm in the middle and the book will be called In the Middle. And it's a kind of a history of what's happened from an ordinary person's perspective in terms of health and education and philosophy, lifestyle, food, you know, the whole bit, living conditions, family life, etc. And my great grandparents would have no recognition to my grandchildren. You know, it's like different countries, different cultures, everything. And yet with the same same family. Yes, yes, because because the world has changed. Has changed our options. But the art of living is not to say, oh, I want those old options. It's mm -hmm. to say, well, I've got to readjust my goal to what's possible. Mm -hmm. You can't blame the world for not helping you do something that that is blocked for other reasons. You have to, I mean, the best example I can give you is when I couldn't get into the major clubs here, I started looking to Dublin Berlin, uh, where else have I been? Uh, uh, Amsterdam, um, um, uh, then Jakarta, uh, Hanoi, um, Saigon, Bangkok, Manila. Yeah. If I can't make it where I want to make it, I can make it somewhere. What is that song? If That's I don't. That's a song. Yeah. New I... York. New York, New York, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, no, it's if I'm not with the girl I love, I love the girl I'm with. Oh, okay, that's the more modern one, yeah, sure. So, and, and it's what you were saying about following your intuition, reinventing yourself, assessing the situation. The intuition is huge, isn't it? Absolutely huge. Because you've got to believe you're worth it. And, it, and it's not fashionable to believe you're worth it. Mm -hmm. your parents have disciplined you, the world has disciplined you, your partner has said you're inadequate this way or that. Stop it. Mm. You're perfect. Whatever you are, you're perfect. Any defense, any things you do that you feel is counterproductive, those are defenses you built up because of something that happened to you. They'll go away when you don't need them. Mm, absolutely. Okay. <laughs> yeah. All those countries you mentioned, Lynn Ruth, have you actually had gigs in all those countries that you rattled on? I have had gigs in. Oh, yeah. I've been, I've, and I go back. I've been to Singapore, I think, four times, five times. Bangkok, I know I've been three, maybe four. Jakarta, I know twice. Uh, Manila, only once. He keeps asking me back, but we can't get it organized. Dublin, oh, 10, 15 times. Wow. Amsterdam, the same. Berlin, the same. So how, how do you describe your, your form of comedy? Is there a particular niche or genre? or I don't know how you, how you categorize comedy. Well, I'm going to say my comedy is funny. <laughs> but I uh, ascribe to the old school, the old school formula, which, by the way, is fading. But the old school formula is set up, punch, laugh. And it works. It works. Other comedians very often do longer build ups. But I don't because set up, punch, laugh works in a live audience. When you do Zoom, it's long set up, punch, because you don't get the laugh. But and that's a different art. And I think that's really interesting that I have a new art. 
87 years old and you're you're a new kid on the block really i mean the technology and you're doing comedy on zoom as well as in person now i, I, I take my hat off you're wonderful i also do audio tapes you have to you can't say why don't we have a telephone attached to the wall it isn't anymore yeah i object to people that say to me oh i don't use them because i live in a, 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 a um, sheltered housing situation oh i don't use a computer well why are you living in the world mm. <laughs> you're here mm. the only thing you've got is now so why not look at now and try to figure out how to how to how to manage it but the most important thing i come back to it all the time is you're worth it you are worth it i always used to say to my children when i taught them i would say the air is sweeter because you breathed it and they would say oh and then i would say to them and this is and you know i coined this and i think it's the best thing i ever said when they would do tests they would look you see the right answer and i would say to them i don't want you to be like that one and i don't want you to be like that one we have one of those be like you mm. can't answer that question who cares you can answer a question they can't be you and that's one of the things i object to when i object to this universal thing for university education mm. because not everybody does well with an academic and then what you do is you set up children for feeling inadequate and they're not inadequate they're just what they are mm. which is what we need i think i'm a bit of an idealist but I, that's how i've lived wonderful so how can people contact you how can people book you for a gig how can people see you know come and see you they can book me i'm on uh, www.lynruthmiller.com. I'm on Instagram. I believe it's lynruth82. But I'm on Instagram. You put in lynruth, I'll come up. I'm on Twitter, uh, lynruth. I'm on Facebook, lynruth miller. Um, I'm I'm no farther than your telephone. I, I'm all over the web. I say yes to just about everything. Now I'm interested in doing house parties. And the reason I'm interested in doing house parties is I don't want to compete. Lockdown has been not profitable for major comedians. So now major comedians are willing to take less money. So they're taking my gigs mm. before they wouldn't touch them, but they've got to make up for the fact they haven't made money in a long, long time. So I'm into house parties because I absolutely love the connection with the human, with the other person. I love it. I just did one, as you know, for our mutual friend and she loved it and they loved it. And we adapted everything, the comedy, the singing, the whole thing to, to that specific audience. You would have thought we were, I don't know big stars today, Meryl Streep or something, or Cher. We weren't. We were just ordinary, a guitarist who sings okay, and an old lady that tells okay jokes. That's all. But to them, because it was their entertainment, nothing we said or did didn't relate to them. Wonderful. And that's, that's, a, that's a gift that you have. When you're playing to a live audience, you can read the audience when you're playing, um, uh, doing a gig on Zoom, you haven't got that feedback. So it must be quite different for, for you when you're in two different settings. You are absolutely right, but I've got an ego. And if I'm doing a set that I think is wonderful, I'm just sure they're going to love it. <laughs> I guess, because I did a set where I thought I was really, really good. And the host wrote and said, oh, I'm so sorry. That was a bad audience. I'm saying, no. It was good <laughs> so i've got that ego i did not have it in the beginning but i've been doing it now i'm saying 17 it's almost 18 years you sort of get and that's the wonderful thing with the open windows and closed doors if 
five years ago even, you had said to me, okay, Lynn Ruth, my God, the guy that was supposed to be scheduled has just gotten the flu. I need you to go right now and do 20 minutes. I would have said to you, oh, but I need some time to think and to think what I'm, get me up there. I can do it. Mm, brilliant. And, no, and I can have fun doing it. That is the key to me for everything in life. If we have fun, if we're passionate about the thing that we're doing, whatever the thing is, uh, we have fun doing it. If we have fun, then we shine. We look after ourselves. We look after our health. We inspire other people. And then the whole world's a happier place, isn't it? And the world can be a happier place. It can be if we make it that way. And remember Viktor Frankl, remember where he says, happiness is a side, a side product. Well, I'm not calling it the right thing. It's, 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 it can't, it's a side product. It's a word for it. Wealth is, it, it, it comes as a result of something else. It's a side issue. Mm -hmm. I'm happy because I love what I'm doing. I love the people are asking me to do something. I love the people I'm with. And except for that one little problem that you and I have discussed, which I'm going to wipe out of my mind because I love, I love that I love my life. Brilliant. And, and it isn't a formula life. And that's what the snowflakes have to understand. It isn't the life I thought, and I was convinced that my life would be getting married at 21 to a, a rich Jewish something, <laughs> preferably a doctor, uh, Richard, living in the suburbs, hmm? living in the suburbs, uh, uh, having a maid, having a maid, and getting my hair done on Thursdays, um, doing the big dinner on Fridays, going out with my uh, husband and my friends on uh, Saturdays and complaining on Sundays. That was going to be my life. I was going to have, this is so typically me, I wanted 12 children. I wanted children until my pelvis woke. <laughs> I want children and, and, and this husband. The truth is that the best thing in the world that happened to me is that none of that came true. None of it. What a lucky woman I am. And the even luckier thing is the fact that you recognize it, you acknowledge it and you recognize it and give thanks to the life that you've got, which is absolutely fabulous. I'm sure we're going to talk again, Lynn Ruth. I've really enjoyed hearing your, some of your stories. And I'm sure the, the listeners uh, will be looking you up. So lynnruthmiller.com and um, you can see where all your gigs are and, and so on. And there's other things to talk about, but we don't have time today. You've got stories, you've written books. There's a whole ton of stuff that we can talk about another time. And we must do it. We must do it. Thank you so much for giving me this platform. It's lovely. Thank you. Pure joy talking to you. Thank you so much. And we'll talk again soon.